So we've been um, looking at a series on the Jubilees in Scripture. And you can't really understand Jubilee unless you understand bondage, unless you understand that people are imprisoned, unless you understand that there are people that are actually held captive. You can really only understand Jubilee when you know what you've been set free from. And in this last few weeks, we've looked at slavery in the past. We've looked at slavery in the present. This week, we're going to be looking at slavery in the future. And boy, there's going to be a lot of it, a lot of it. Now, I'm calling this particular um, sermon Critical Mass because this planet is about to reach critical mass. I'll explain that as we go on. But if you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 1, we'll start there. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged or cleansed our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What an introduction that is to a book. And this tells us that Jesus is not just the Son of God, he is the creator of everything that has ever been. And that everything is, this is crucial to this particular session, everything is held together by the power of his word. Now, we're living in a time where um, we have the greatest experiment of all time is the Hadron Collider. And in the Hadron Collider, they're literally smashing together protons, trying to kind of backward engineer God's creation, trying to work out the building blocks of God's creation. And within the atom, there are two main, there are lots of things going on in the atom, but there are two opposing forces. Anybody ever got two magnets? positive charge and a positive charge, and you try and bring two very strong magnets together. They don't want to go, do they? They'll do anything but go together. So at the very centre of an atom, you've got positively charged protons that don't want to be together. And the force that wants to um, rip them apart is incredible. It's called the electromagnetic force. And it's much, much, much stronger than gravity, in, infinitely stronger than gravity. And it's constantly trying to push apart these positively charged protons. However, there's another law at work in the atom called the strong nuclear force that's roughly a hundred times stronger than the electromagnetism. And the strong nuclear force is grabbing hold of these protons like it, this strong man and keeping them together. And they want to go that way, but he's keeping them together like that. And they're held there in perfect harmony. And everything that you see in the universe, every piece of matter, is, is made of these atoms. And they are literally held between two opposing forces. The Bible tells us what that force actually is. Science will call it the strong nuclear force. The Bible calls it being upheld or being held together by the power of his word. It was his word that spoke creation into being. And it's his word that holds creation together. When 
we see, and we'll look at this as we go on, when we see the removal of the Word of God from nations that used to have the Word of God, what you end up with is a, a, is a destabilizing of a nation. It becomes unstable. Unstable. And that's what we're seeing today. We're seeing nations going from being stable and held together to unstable and dangerous. That's what's happening right now. So at the beginning we see Jesus held the entire or holds the entire universe together by the power of his word. But have a look at 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10. We see something amazing. The words that Peter, a fisherman of 2,000 years ago, uses here, we use today of the periodic table and, and of atoms. It's incredible. So right at the end, this is what we read. But the, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements, now we get the word atom, atoms from this word. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, this is really important. Therefore, since these things will be, your Bible probably says dissolved or something like that. Since these things will be, the actual word is loosed. So they're held together, but there's coming a point when these things will be literally loosed. In other words, God will let go. The very thing that is holding the world together now, the word of God, the reason why we need the word of God in the infrastructure of our societies is because it holds nations together. At the end of time, God lets go. And when God lets go, boy, are we going to know about it. And it says, since these things are going to happen, and the, the, at the atomic level, things are going to be loosed. So this fisherman from Galilee is describing the splitting of an atom 2,000 years before time. What, now this is crucial. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? In holy conduct and godliness. In other words, sanctification is not an optional extra. Does everybody understand that? The word sanctification means to, to be made holy, to go on, to become more like Christ. Sanctification, according to the word of God, is not an optional extra. As we see these things begin to happen, what manner of persons ought we to be? And as we see not just the world, but, the, but churches letting go of the word, Sanctification is almost a four-letter word today. Nobody wants to talk about it anymore. But we're going to be looking at it a lot this morning. So hopefully you can see that it's Jesus that holds everything together by the power of his word. And it's Jesus that's going to let go. And when he lets go, Isaiah says it's going to wind itself up like a scroll. It's going to be some event. Some event. Okay, let's have a look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 34. These are basic things that we have to get. Jesus says something in John chapter 8, which is crucial for us to understand in 2023. John chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. 
we're living in a time where westernized nations think that they're liberating themselves by sinning against God. But Jesus tells us, whoever commits a sin will become a slave to sin. And what we see at the end of time, according to the Bible, is the greatest manifestation of slavery that this world has ever or will ever know. You know why? Because sin will be at its zenith. So slavery will be at its zenith. Does that make sense? So there's slavery past, slavery present, and slavery future. And Jesus himself, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, tells us, contrary to what we're told today, sin enslaves you. Sin enslaves you. All of Scripture bears out what Jesus says here. All of Scripture. And every person in this room has at some point experienced some kind of bondage to sin. Now let's have a look at uh, the book of Judges. The book of Judges chapter 3. We're going to go through this together this morning. So... We looked at Joshua this morning. Joshua's already been mentioned. After the death of Joshua, the gift replaced the giver. Creation replaces the creator. Do you understand? They inherit the promised land. It's a gift. But the gift becomes more important than the giver. And creation becomes more important than the creator. And that happens, doesn't it? It can happen in life, Alex said last week, it's lovely, I love, loved how he said it, Jane's lived in a tiny little one bedroom house for the longest time and they've just bought a bigger house and Alex said to me, he says, I can't wait for the uh, house groups to start again because we'd love to have a house group there. Now, now folks, the gift that God gives us, whatever it is, can be used for his glory. And the gift never, should never become more important than the giver. I can remember um, when I was really ill, my mother invited a family member, born again Christian, a lady, to come round and pray for us all in my mum and dad's front room. And um, she came along, and I'd had these results and stuff, I've got to go in for an operation. And she came and she, she got us in this in a circle and she prayed the most beautiful prayer and my dad I've, I've, it's the only time in my life I've really ever seen the Holy Spirit begin to get through to him and my mum was crying and there was a sense of God in that room after we finished praying my dad sat down in his chair we call it the it was like the Christmas rooms where we always celebrate Christmas and people would come in and he sat there and he said in this kind of um, subdued voice, when I was a boy, I used to see this all the time. There'd be Christians coming in and out, in and out, because my grandma and granddad were Methodist lay preachers, very well known. And people would be coming in and out, in and out, all the time. They'd be singing on the piano, there'd be Bible studies. He said, people would come in, needy people that couldn't afford it, because it was a very big house. And uh, they, could, they could, you know, stay in a, a house and all that. He says, it's just reminded me. And I thought, Dad, Dad. And he lives in this house on his own with his, with his wife, in the conservatory. His favourite hobby is putting logs on the fire. That's about as exciting as life gets for him right now. I'm thinking, Dad, you could have that back. You could have that back. Your house could be a, a, a house group for Christians. But so often in, in life, the gift that's given to us becomes more important than the giver. And creation becomes more important than the creator. And we go into idolatry. And idolatry is sin. 
So this is how it started. This is how it started. And it always starts quite innocently, folks. People don't sit there and think, you know what? I'm going to plan to really transgress in a vile way tomorrow. That's not how it is. It's a slow process. So this is what it says in Judges chapter 3, verse 12. And the children of Israel again did evil in what? Because this is really important. Not in their own eyes, in the eyes of God. They did evil in the eyes of God. God's standards never change. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. His standards never change. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek and went and defeated Israel. Listen very carefully. This is important. And took possession of the city of Palms. So the children served, served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. And what happens, always what happens, is they cry out to God. They cry out to God at that place. God answers their prayer. They continue for a time serving him. And then the whole process starts again. It's a cycle. And we see all the way through the scripture. Is that you? Is that your life? Is your life like that? Where you're going along with the Lord, you start to take things for granted, you start to get bored, you, your, your eyes start to wander. Before you know it, you end up in some kind of a sin. That sin brings bondage. That bondage makes you so miserable that eventually you cry out to the Lord and he answers. And he comes to your aid. It, Israel is a microcosm of us in our entirety. All of us are like Israel. We're no better. The church, friends, is no better than Israel. Now, I've shared this dream quite a few times over the last, I would imagine, 15 to 20 years. And you can judge for yourself whether this is a cheese dream or whether this has come from the Lord. It's not for me to say, but, you know, obviously I wouldn't be telling you if I wasn't pretty convinced that this is from the Lord. So, about 15 years ago, I had a very, very vivid dream. In this dream, I'm, I'm standing in the conservatory with my dad. And we're looking out at the conservatory at England's green and pleasant lands. Uh, don't ask me how that works, but that was the dream. We're looking out on this lush, beautiful nation that we live in. And as we're looking, we see these strange things coming down from the sky, landing on the earth, and things pouring out of them and going in every direction. And then another one lands, things pouring out. Another one lands, things pouring out. And in the dream, I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, can you see what's happening? And, and my dad turned around in the dream and looked me straight in the eyes and said, No. And I woke up. And when I woke up, these three words came instantly. Invasion, occupation, destruction. Followed immediately by three other words. Death, burial and resurrection. And I, I lay there on the pillar and I don't know how this works, maybe you understand. But I knew that the first three words were for this world. There's three phases. The enemy invades, then he occupies... Then he tries his best to destroy. But there are three phases for the church. Just as Jesus died and was buried and resurrected, so the church has to go through three phases. Death, burial and resurrection. And we have to die to self. We must 
It's not optional. We have to die to self. And so there's three phases that the church has to go through. And all the way through the Bible, the devil, in one form or another, invades an area, occupies an area, and then tries his best to destroy that area. But when the children cry out, they have to go through a phase. They have to go through death, burial, and at the point when they're about to be destroyed, they're resurrected. And God doesn't let it happen. And this process goes through the scripture time and time and time and time again. The people sin, there's an invasion. The invasion turns to occupation. The occupation turns to certain destruction. But God's people begin to cry out. And as they cry out, they go through a process of death, burial and resurrection. And at the point when they're supposed to be destroyed, they're resurrected. Let's go for another one. Judges chapter 4. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who, who reigned in Hazar. The commander of his army was Assyria. Now this army, I don't know whether you can see, is even bigger And the oppression lasts for 20 years and they are harshly oppressed. Why? Because whoever commits sin becomes a slave to sin. These aren't just fancy words written in the Bible. These are warnings for the future. And so whenever a nation goes into sin, God allows an invasion to happen. An invasion that turns to an occupation, which ultimately nearly turns to a destruction. But God does his thing. How many times in your life have you had to humble yourself? How many times in your life have you come to a point where you know you've got to mortify the flesh? You have to die to self, death, burial, and when you do that, God resurrects you. God resurrects you every time. That's what he does. He's so faithful. These are almost laws. But this time, this is 20 years of oppression and slavery. 20 years. And they're dealing with Israel very harshly. But Israel cries out. And again, God is faithful. I I don't know about you. I see my own life here. I see the times where you slip into things. You cry out to the Lord and the Lord does what only the Lord can do. Let's have a look at Judges chapter 6. We looked at it a bit last week. Judges chapter 6. Then, guess what? Spoiler alert. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian for seven years. Same thing again, isn't it? Now Satan manifests himself in different ways, in different times. In these times, he manifested himself as Baal. Baal worship, we looked at this last week, and the worship of Ashtoreth was... Particularly vile. Um, Some people even sacrifice their own children in the flames. But the the heart of this was, was, was sexual immorality. Every kind of sexual immorality you could possibly imagine. There's nothing new under the sun. Nothing. What is to come has already been. God declares the end from the beginning. And so... Deuteronomy tells us that the worship of Baal is the worship of demons. So Baal, Asherah, Molech, Zeus, Aphrodite, Apollo, Artemis, Athena, Hermes, Mars, Jupiter, Venus. Whatever it happens to be, the Bible tells us that the worship of these gods is actually the worship of demons. And it tells us in Galatians... Even if an angel were to come with another gospel, let that angel be accursed. You know why? 
because Satan himself can parade himself as an angel of light with another gospel and he will do at the end of time. So throughout history Satan has manifested himself in various ways and people have been drawn in. In the days of Elijah they couldn't actually see anything wrong with worshipping Baal and Yahweh at the same time until Elijah came along. It was acceptable to them but of course it's not acceptable to God. Now I want you to notice how many times the word destroy comes up in terms of sin and slavery. You'll see that word come up so many times in conjunction with sin. So it says, um, The Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, because the Midianites, the children of Israel, made for themselves the dens, the caves, the strongholds, which are in the mountains. And so it was, whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up, also the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. And they would encamp against them and destroy the produce. And again, later on, in verse 5, destroy because the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Every time the people of God sin, there's an invasion. That invasion leads to an occupation. And that occupation, if Satan had his way, would always lead to a destruction. He's about destroying. We see Apollos, Apollo uh, in Revelation chapter 9. We see a destroyer. Let's move on a little bit more. Can you see this pattern? It's the same every time. Judges chapter 10, verse 6. Now every gen new generation thinks they know better, don't they? Have you noticed that? They're the enlightened generation. They always think they know better. So this generation knows better than the generations before that got themselves into a real mess through sin. So guess what they do because they know better. Judges chapter 10 verse 6. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So what did they do? They served the Baals. They served the Asherahs. But not only that. They served the gods of Syria. The gods of Sidon. The gods of Moab. The gods of the people of Ammon. And the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Because they know better. This is a new generation. They're more sophisticated. So they don't just worship Baal and Asherah. Yeah, they're going for a whole plethora. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hands of the Philistines. And into the hands of the people of Ammon. From that year they harassed and oppressed the children of Israel for 18 years. Anybody ever heard of Greenbelt? Greenbelt's a Christian festival, or shall we say, it was a Christian festival. Now it's always been a little bit kind of, you know, loose, Greenbelt. But this year, they decided to um, go all out on the theme of drag queens. Drag queens. So... They want to somehow show that this thing is actually good. So what they've done is they've got the school of drag. So the school of drag is age appropriate. So the idea is, is that through the school of drag, they will um, nurture, groom the children into believing that drag stuff is actually good. But what they say, and I, I encourage you to read the article for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Read the article for yourself. What they say is, because this is age appropriate, this, is, this was a Christian festival, 
they're encouraging the adults to go to the adult tent at night where they'll really see what the drag circuit looks like. And it actually says, and there's, <laughs> don't worry, there's an alcohol-free bar that the, that the Methodist Church are running. <laughs> Go really for yourself. You, honestly, it, you cannot believe it. So the main drag artist, and by the way, I don't know if you know this, but one, um, in, in one of the Christian charts recently, a drag queen went to number one in the Christian charts. Did you know that? Number one. So the, the drag queen at the Greenbelt Christian Festival, they've entitled it, Drag Me to Heaven. Drag Me to Heaven. Do you understand that this is slavery, right? That this is only ever church. You can't argue with history. It only ever leads to bondage and slavery. And these clever, civilized, kind of enlightened teachers and preachers that want to groom our children today into God only knows what are enslaving themselves. The slave trade hasn't gone away. The greatest manifestation of slavery that this world has ever seen is in the future. Did you know that? Oh yeah. Slavery is on its way back. I'll tell you why. Because whoever commits sin becomes a slave to sin. And wickedness hasn't, is nowhere near at its zenith yet. But it's going to get there. And slavery will abound on this planet. Judges chapter 13, verse 1. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord, what did he do? Invasion, occupation, and without the help of the Lord, destruction. Without the intervention of God, destruction. Without the church getting down on their knees... Going through the process of death, burial and resurrection, picking up their cross and realising that we have to mortify the flesh. What manner of peoples ought we to be in the days come? And he says in holy conduct that the church has to do this. And when the church does this and when the church has ever done this, there's always a deliverance from destruction and a resurrection. Always. Because God is faithful. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years, and God raised up a man called Samson. Now, Samson's an interesting character. Reminds me of many preachers today. We preachers today, we're like Samson. We, we stand against the things that are coming in. However, so many preachers like Samson think they're immune to the effects of sin in their own life. So they're fighting against the Philistines, but at the same time, they're, they're having a little taste of Philistine lifestyle. And Samson thought he could get away with this. His hair had been cut. He said, I will get up as I always have done. And he did not know that the spirit had departed from him. That's what's happening today. Do you understand? We have people today standing for God, but at the same time, they enjoy the things of the world. And like Samson, they think somehow the rules don't apply to them. It's so scary. It's so scary. I find Samson so scary because I can identify to Samson. And if, if we don't think this is us, folks, we, we, we are prone to making exactly the same errors. So it's the same process, but this time, even Samson ends up in bondage. Even the deliverer himself, Samson, ends up in bondage. And you see him grinding at the stone, going round and round and round, but his hair is beginning to grow back. And at the end of his life, when he's been taunted and tormented and made a mockery of, he simply says this, Lord God, 
gets his hand between the two pillars and says, Lord God, just give me one more chance. One more chance. And for many of us, that's where we're at. Lord God, just give me one more chance. And he brought the house down. 1 Kings 11. 1 Kings 11, 6. Well, 1 Kings 11, 5. For Solomon went after the Asherah and the goddess of the Sidians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did, did evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not fully follow the Lord, as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place to Chemosh, and the abomination of Moab, and on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon, he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon. Even Solomon, who at the beginning of his life asked for wisdom, and he was given wisdom, couldn't apply that wisdom to himself. So many of us are like that. We judge others by the sins that we don't commit. But we don't apply that wisdom to ourselves. And so in the days of Solomon, the kingdom split. There was a terrible split. So what we see from Samuel to Saul to David to Solomon is the same pattern. Can you see this, friends, in, in the Bible? It's the same pattern. The people sin. Their sin ends up in slavery. In their enslavement, they cry out to God. And in God's faithfulness to us and his covenant he rescues us we see it again and again and again and again let's have a look at 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 20 1 Kings 18 verse 20 I explained earlier on in the year that classical computers work off noughts and ones. That's all they can do. That's all they're capable of. They calculate in binary. They calculate in noughts and ones. That's all they know. That's all they're ever going to know. Quantum computers are very, very different creatures. And they can see any superposition between naught and one. Anything between naught and one. Any variable between naught and one, they can see and calculate. It's the, the very odd things. Well, when Elijah comes along, Israel is in a superposition between the worship of Baal and the worship of Yahweh. Do you understand? They're in a superposition. They're somewhere between the two. And they think it's okay. So 1 Kings 18, 20. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? This is what's going to happen. This is what God said to Gideon. So many of us think, well, God said to Gideon, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor, now go and destroy the Midianites. But that's not what he said. What he said is, now go to your home village and pull down the idols and burn them and put an altar there to the Lord. Do you understand, friends? This is so important. Now here, Elijah is making this declaration. You can't be somewhere between the two. So many of us, perhaps all of us, I don't know, like Samson, are in the fight. They know right and wrong, 
But they have pet sins. Pet things, private things in their life that they just don't want to let go of. And so they build like a safeguarding around those sins. They treat those sins like precious children that nobody can touch. They make all kinds of justification as to why they don't need to let those sins go. We all do. We're all like Samson. We're in this fight. But actually, there's a fight in us. Elijah was not like that. Elijah was a very different man. Elijah, the Spirit of God was upon this man. And he said, you've got to decide. You cannot keep this superposition between one and the other. What manner of people ought we to be as we see this day approaching? In holy conduct. Now, listen, friends. Before I go any further, please understand... You cannot do this. I cannot do this. This is not a work of the flesh. Sanctification is not a work of the flesh. It's a work of the Spirit. But we have to be willing. And I honestly think it is the only hope for the church as we see that day approaching. It is our only hope. Because there's, there is no power at the moment. The church is impoverished, powerless, feeble, weak. Why? Because we don't take the altar down. We see those rainbow flags. I'm only using that as an excuse. It's an easy target. God forgive me. It's an easy target. But we see those rainbow flags and we think they're here to stay. No, they're not. God says they're an evil thing in my sight. But when anything in our lives, it could be your house, it could be your son or your daughter, when anything takes the place of God and it becomes, instead of being a servant in your life, it starts to become a master, it's the same problem. Folks, I've seen people almost manifest demonically over their hobby, a a harmless hobby. Because whenever anything takes the place of God, we, it becomes and we become an enmity to him. Yeah. So Elijah stands on the top and says, you can't have it both ways. Sanctification is not an optional extra. It's hard, isn't it? Oh, it's, I find this, so I've been looking, thinking about this for weeks now. Thinking, God, this is so hard. This is the hardest challenge of my life. I can't think of anything harder. And yet, without it, folks, the church is powerless. We don't have any authority. 2 Kings 17, verse 5. Now the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, The king of Assyria, he took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria. The whole of the northern kingdom was taken away. Invasion, occupation, destruction. 732. How many times did they go through that cycle? How many times? But at the end of it, God says, enough. And they're taken. They reach a critical mass. And God says, I'm handing you over. And off they go. 597 BC, faithful Judah, the same thing happens. Same pattern, good kings, bad kings, good kings, bad kings. But there comes a point where God says, enough, I'm handing you over. And in 597 BC, even Judah was taken off to Babylon. Invasion, occupation, destruction. The Assyrians took the northern kingdom, the Babylonians took the southern kingdom. They had the same thing with the Medes and Persians, the same thing with the Greek Empire, the same thing with the Roman Empire. Time and time and time again, the people of Israel go through the same cycle. And so do you and so do I. And if God wasn't gracious and loving and compassionate and patient, nobody could stand. Have a look at Romans chapter 1 verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man 
and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. What did, that, what did they call that thing? Drag me to heaven? Drag me to heaven? You know, in a very strange way, some people are going to go kicking and screaming to heaven if God is truly good. He's going to have to put some people through a terrible furnace in order for them to see how much he loves them. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and in the loss of the heart. It's the same in the New Testament as it was in the other. Nothing changes. Yeah. He gives them up. He gives them over. All the way to the rebuilding of some kind of Babylon in the last days, this will constantly go on and God gives them over. Look at this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. I believe that Paul here is quoting Everything that we've just seen in the Old Testament, here. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. Remember with Israel, they ended up sinning worse than the nations they'd driven out. The same thing happens with the church. There's things happening at that green belt thing that you don't see happening at a secular concert. What's behind all this? He says, he says that sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. That a man has his father's wife and you are puffed up. He says, you, as a church, you can't even see that this is wrong. They're so ingrained into this culture, they cannot see how wrong it is. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For indeed, as absent in the body but present in the spirit, have already, I have already judged as though I were present. Him who has done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when you are gathered together along with my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved. Nothing changes folks. This is the Bible we're reading. I, I, you know, I look, sometimes I look at and I, I, I know you're thinking that can't be the Bible. No, this is the Bible. This is what the Bible teaches about sin. Hand them over. If that's what they want, hand them over. Let them taste slavery. Let them taste bondage. Let them know what it is to, to feel an absence of God in their life. That at some point, maybe they'll call out to me. And in my love for them, I will rescue them. And that's what he's saying about this man. And when we read 2 Corinthians, we find out that this man did have a change of heart. Even in this sin. But we, now we've got this thing today where, oh, I identify as this thing and that's who I am. And you can't, you've just got to accept me for who I am. That's not what Paul said. Paul said, such were some of you. Such were some of you. But you were washed and you were cleansed. You were sanctified by the blood of Jesus. This is the power of the gospel. It has not changed. It's us that's changed. You think about this guy that's done this, kind of being dragged, kicking and screaming to heaven. So in a way they might be right, drag me to heaven. Maybe there's something in it. Because there are so many Christians, folks, that are so hell-bent on sinning that they would have to be dragged there. That's the good news. Now let's move on to the bad. <laughs> Second Thessalonians. Critical mass. Critical mass. It's a very, very... <sighs> Critical mass is when an unstable material reaches a point where a chain reaction can happen. 
what's going on in Iran right now is they're trying to enrich uranium, make it to 235. Why? Because it's utterly unstable. So unstable that under the right conditions you could just fire one neutron at one atom in that which would cause a chain reaction and of course they would love to use those things on Israel. And so they're, they're, in the moment they are desperately trying to enrich this matter called uranium because it's so unstable. And what's happening right now is the same thing in the world. God holds this world in the, uh, together in the power of his word. You take away the word and the world becomes unstable. And that's what we have on this planet now. The world has become, even unsafe people, even secular people know, this world is going nuts, like seriously nuts. Why? Because we rejected God. We are post-Christian. The word is going. And the whole thing is unstable. It ain't going to take much. But there's something else that is so fascinating. I don't know how they did this back in the 1940s. It's bizarre how they even did it. But they have managed to get together like a ball of uranium, plutonium, around about that size, about six kilograms, about that size. But that ball inside of the bomb, that's the thing that goes. And when that goes, when the atom splits in that, it unleashes hell. That ball can only go into a chain reaction if the ball is compressed equally on every side so that the ball is two and a half times more dense than it was at the beginning. Okay? So you have to get this unstable material and crush it in every direction equally, perfectly equally, so that it's much, much smaller, so that all the atoms are so crammed together that when a neutron hits one and splits one, and those, uh, those atoms create more neutrons that go off of the... The atoms are so tightly knitted together that there is a... Just goes. And in one billionth of a second, critical mass, bang, it's gone. But in order for, to that, for that to happen, that material has to be crushed almost half of its size. You know how they did that? This is unbelievable. They put detonators all the way around, but they knew that if they detonated bombs all the way around the sphere, that it would, it would, it would create an irregular shape. And therefore, you wouldn't get a chain reaction. So around those detonators, they put other detonators, which... To cut a long story short, how they did this back in the 1940s is simply staggering. But they managed to create a perfect explosion, a uh, uniform explosion around this matter that crushed it down to half of its size. Once you got it down to half of its size, you reach supercritical mass. When you reach supercritical mass, all it takes is one neutron and it goes up. The world is becoming one place. We're being crushed together. The more and more people are pouring into cities from here, from there, from everywhere. Let's form these global villages where you can't go out because they want to create a much denser planet so that when this thing goes, people will go down like a pack of dominoes. Do you understand? That's critical mass. And that's what's happening. Let me, let's just go through this. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, hallelujah, it's going to happen. God is faithful. We ask you not to be soon shaken. Notice that. And that, that we saw that during COVID. Not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word, not God's word, obviously, or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you. The, the, the main evidence of the last days is the massive increase in deception. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day cannot come unless the falling away comes first. So what happened with Israel time and time and time again, where they sin and that sin results into slavery, that's going to happen 
on a global level. There's coming a catastrophic falling away on this planet. And by the way, I'm talking about churchgoers here. Catastrophic, that's what's coming. The falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition, like a neutron, poof, into an atom. Bang, 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 bang. One bil- Jesus says the end will be like a flood. The son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's his ultimate aim. Do you not remember uh, when I was with you, I told you these things and now you know what is restraining him. And we know that the Holy Spirit restrains, holds back evil. In the same way that inside of an atom, you've got this constant pressure um, pushing outwards and you've got the strong nuclear force holding this thing together. There comes a point we see in Genesis chapter 6 where God says, my spirit will not strive with man forever. And bang, the spirit goes. Do you understand? The planet reaches critical mass. When God allows it, when the lamb takes the seal off the, the, the scroll, the planet reaches critical mass. The spirit goes, bang. That he may be revealed in his own time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And now he who restrains will do so until he is taken away, and the lawless not one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is in according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders and all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they what? They did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason God will send them a strong delusion that they might believe the lie. Same thing again. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, hand him over. God says here, at this time in history, I'm going to hand them over to a very strong delusion. Now we know, because the Bible tells us, that this, this delusion is so strong that even the elect could be deceived by this. Hence why we're showing this video tonight. Because there's a reason why Congress have, have leaked these things out at this time. I'm not saying there's going to be aliens, folks. I don't, I, I don't believe in aliens. But I know there's going to be a rise in the demonic. That's what's coming. A rise in demonic deception. And just as Satan could take on the form of Baal or Asherah or Zeus or Mars or whatever, in the last days he has his own peculiar thing that will deceive the planet, if possible. Let's go to Daniel 8. Bring this thing to a conclusion. Daniel chapter 8, notice this, verse 23. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors transgressors have reached their fullness. Does everybody understand what's going on here? When the world is totally disabilized. When transgression has run in every direction. When churches have capitulated completely on these things and where they're no longer ashamed to call sin, sin, they actually almost see it as a banner, some kind of pride thing. When transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise at that time. This is what brings him in. Critical mass. A king shall arise with fierce countenance because God allows it. He takes the restrainer away. Who understands sinister schemes, his power shall be mighty, but not his own power. No, he tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2 that this this man will be energised by the devil himself. He shall, notice the word, he shall what? Destroy, fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive. Now it tells us in Matthew chapter 24 that unless those days were shortened, and they will be for the election's sake, he says... Jesus says, no flesh would survive. Do you understand the connotations of that? The worst nuclear bomb, by the way, is, they call them a a, a salty nuke. It's, it's 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 cobalt. It's cobalt that they use to split. Because 
The radiation off cobalt will, will last 100 years. If they ever let one of those things off, it's, it's, a, it's a world ender. Yeah. And the Russian subs apparently have these cobalt things. So the, we, the technology has arrived. We are there right now. The, the technology to end all flesh has arrived. But God says he will not allow it to happen. His power shall be mighty, but not of his own. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. And he shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Now, at this point, and I'm not going to get into the timing of the rapture, that is not the point of this this morning. But you need to understand this. This idea that these kind of things cannot happen to God's holy people is simply not true. You see this here? Clive came in with this. These are the things that are happening around the world now. Not in the future, now. It's already happening. And people that are, that are living a sanctified, holy life are finding themselves in hell holes. But the Lord is with them. The Lord is with them. So this idea that it can't happen to holy people, folks, it's just not true. It's happened so many times in history. It's just not true. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. He shall intend to change times and law, and the saints shall be given into his hand for a time's time and half a time. Now the Bible tells us those days will be shortened. For the elect's sake, they will be shortened. Jesus is coming for his bride. He's coming for his bride. But do you honestly think, in the light of everything that we've looked at this morning, that our God is going to wrap us up in cotton wool and allow us to continue our sloppy, apathetic, sinful lives and then just take us out of here. When the whole of history, the whole of history bears witness against this. That actually God is in the process of preparing a bride and he's in the process of sanctifying his people because there is a wedding coming. And he wants a spotless bride. Amen. Revelation chapter 13. We're coming to an end church. I know this is a hard word this morning. But. You hear these ridiculous. Drag me to heaven. Drag me to heaven. Christians saying this kind of stuff. Do you understand why these things have to happen? Revelation chapter 13. It was, verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints. So in, in the Greek it's hagios, hagios, to make war with the saints. Who are these saints? Folks, we could argue about that until the cows come home. The point is they are saints. They are God's people, just as Job was God's people. Amen. They are saints. You say, well, it can't happen to me as long as it happens to these I'm not bothered, as long as it doesn't happen to me. Well, how is that fair? How does that work? To make war the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given them over every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And all who dwell on the earth, that is earth dwellers, those that love the world, will worship him, whose name is not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Listen very carefully. Jesus said this phrase to every single one of the seven churches. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Folks, in the same way, Romans chapter 8, that the Spirit of God bears witness to our spirit that we are the children of God. So anybody that has an ear... To hear what the Spirit is actually saying. Bearing witness to us of where we are and where we're going. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who is led into captivity shall go into captivity. It's a direct quote from Jeremiah about Babylon. He who is killed with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. The word here, I've told you many times before, the word is hupomone. 
The word is staying power. The word is hold on. As you see in Ephesians chapter 6, having done all, stand. Keep on standing. Put on the whole armour of God. And every part of that armour is Jesus. From the head to the toe, it's Jesus having done all, saints. Dear saints of God, whom God loves and his son died for in the most vile way. God loves you. He can't, the devil can't snatch you out of the hand of Jesus. But it doesn't mean we're not going to be refined. I, I, I heard a guy, I forget his name, maybe I don't need to mention his name anyway, but he's a guy that for, for, for the whole longest time has said, you know, the church won't have to go through these things. I heard him the other day say, the church will have to go through tribulations. And, and his congregation went deathly silent. And he said, what's up with you? Because he'd spent his life telling them, no, 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 no. Nothing's coming, don't worry, we're just going to get, we're, he's going to wrap us up in cotton wool and take us away. All of a sudden this man has had a change of mind. If anyone hears, let him hear. Whatever you think about the timing of the rapture, listen. Persecution is coming. It's coming. And it's coming to the church. And our job, friends, our first job is not to go running into the nations, but it's to take down the altar of offence to a holy God. Final scripture. Final scripture. Let's go back to um, Romans, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I've gone to Daniel 8. Romans 8. Verse 15. Let's read this together. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, slavery, again to fear. That is not what you were called for. We were not called to be yellow bellies. And there are times in my life where I have gone into fear. And you can never be in fear when you're in the spirit. Oh, it's a battle. It's a battle. But he wants us in faith. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry. And that word means shout, scream out, Daddy, Abba, Daddy, Abba, Abba, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. Joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, then we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy, axios, to be weighed up against the glory of God, which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to the futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labours with birth pangs together until now. This is climbing change. This is what the Bible calls climate change. The creation is groaning, folks. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. How can hope that is seen be hope? For why does one still hope in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with hupomone. Same word, same word. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Many of you know this. Many of you have been through these battles. For we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. 
And we know that all things work together for the good, for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to his image, to the Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. God is letting you know here, he's got you. Amen. That's what this is here for. In this chapter, this is a very end time eschatological chapter. He's got you from start to finish. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, what did he say to Gideon? The Lord is with you, Gideon. If God is for us, God is for us. Who shall be against us? Listen to this. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. All the way through the Bible, Israel is delivered to the enemy. Israel is to deliver to the enemy. Israel is to deliver to the enemy. The, the, the man in Corinthians delivered to the enemy, handed over to the enemy. In Romans chapter 8, the perfect, matchless son of God is delivered over for us all. That's how we know. That's how we know. This is sure. These foundations are sure. Christ was delivered over for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? In other words, if he loved us when we sinned thoughtlessly, how much more does he love us now? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us? Who then shall separate us from what? His love. And I said this last week, I'll say it again. Because all of this comes when you put it all together, you piece together this massive jigsaw puzzle of the Bible, it comes down to this one thing. There is a creator that created the entire universe that wants fellowship, koinonia, with those he's created because he loves them. And his love overrides everything. And so those that are his, folks, we fall. Seven times a righteous man will fall, but he gets back up again. And it's in the getting back up again. He delivered us over to us all. How shall he freely give us all things? Who shall make a charge against his elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died, furthermore is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us all. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness? This is what these people are going through now. It's what they're going through now. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written. And here he quotes from Psalm 44. Go in your own time and look at the context of Psalm 44. Psalm 44 is about the holy ones that are accounted as sleep sheep for the slaughter. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day. Who? The sanctified ones. The holy ones. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Just like Job. Just like Job. Just like the others. But the promise is, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. His love will win out every single time. Yet in all these things... In our many, many failures, of which I am a a, a chief of failures, I'm, I'm, I'm really succeeding in one area, and that is failing. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, demons, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the promise. 
Listen very carefully, friends. In the last days, it's going to be like Samson between the pillars. It's going to be like Gideon's army as they break the jaws of clay. It's going to be like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that said, God is able, but if not. It's going to be like Jonah crying out from the belly of the whale. It's going to be like Peter realising that he's sinking and he cries out, Lord, save me. It's going to be like Rahab putting out the scarlet thread of redemption. It's going to be like Daniel in the lion's den. It's going to be like Moses at the front of the Red Sea with his staff. It's going to be like Noah and his family entering the ark. It's going to be like Abel's blood crying out. It's going to be like Joseph in prison, Stephen being stoned, Elijah being taken up, Paul in perils of death, David running after Goliath. It's going to be like Christ calling out to Lazarus from the tomb. It's going to be like Dagon falling before the ark. It's going to be like the Jews in Petra. It's going to be like the disciples in the upper room waiting. It's going to be like Job saying, I know that my Redeemer lives. And it's going to be like the wise virgins awakening and trimming their lamps. All of these things and many more describe what it's going to be like. So this is the promise. I know if it, if it hasn't convicted you this morning, it's convicted me all week and continues to because I don't know about you, there are times in my life where I feel like a, a, a hypocrite. There are. It's not all the time, but there are times. Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, and this is it, he says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who calls you is faithful. He also will do it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We have so much to thank God for, friends. So much to thank God for.